Hi, everyone. Okay. Welcome to the author chat um, with SJ Sindhu and Soho Press editor uh, Mark Doten. Um, uh, we're so excited for Blue Screen Gods, which is coming out in November, and Mark is going to um, talk to Sindhu all about it. Um, you're muted right now, but in, in the next half hour or so, after Mark goes through his little preamble, uh, I will uh, let everyone unmute and, and ask Cindy any questions that you might have or, or just any comments that you might have. So, and also the chat function is there, so feel free to say hi. And Stephen, you said my preamble is going to be a half hour, is that correct? Yeah. That's Everyone's right. going to enjoy that, right? All right, so I'm going to talk for half an hour and then we'll um, let Cindy answer questions for five minutes. Um, no. Okay, so I'm just really happy to be here today uh, with Sindhu. And Sindhu, it's so nice to, to see you and to get to Zoom with you. It, it has been a while and looking forward to actually, hopefully getting to see you in person this year. Um, this is Soho Press's second uh, book with, with Sindhu after Marriage of a Thousand Lies, which I know some of you are familiar with. It. Uh, won the Publishing Triangle Edmund White Award. It was a Stonewall Honor Book, finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. And Sindhu has also written two hybrid chat books. I, want, I Once Met You, But You Were Dead, uh, published by Split Lip Press, and the forthcoming Dominant Genes from Black Lawrence Press in 2022. Sindhu is a Lambda Literary Fellow and she currently teaches at the University of Toronto Scarborough, which I'm eager to talk to you about. But let's, let's start maybe with a more general question just about the book. So it's really fun to, um, to get to work with an author, you know, uh, for multiple books and to see in your case, uh, there's very loud thunder in Mexico City right now. I don't know if that comes through. Um, to see in your case this this kind of massive expansion of of I don't know if it's if I would say it's ambition, but I think we can say it's ambition. It's certainly scale. the The temporal plane here it takes place over years, and globally this takes place both in Tamil Nadu, India, and in various locales in the United States, including in New York's underground rock scene. Your, your first novel, um, it certainly had a, a, a real global feel to it because it is about an immigrant community in, in the Boston metro area and, and what it's like to be you know, queer within that group, uh, the expectations of family, of culture. But talking about not like, as you were in the early stages of writing Blue Skin Gods, were you consciously sort of deliberately saying, yes, I wanna take on something that's going to be much bigger in terms of, of those questions of scope of time and, and distance? Yeah, I, um, I was in a phase in my writing at that time, like right after I finished marriage where um, I was giving myself challenges to do so I was writing mostly short stories um, and I would like give myself the challenge of killing off a character in a short story or you know um, making something magical happen in a short story that's that's otherwise a realistic literary story so I was doing these challenges and um, just sort of trying to grow as a writer and so when I started to think about my next novel um, I wanted something bigger because marriage is sort of very tightly contained. Uh, it takes place over about four months and it's, it's very much, you know, um, there's a lot of immediacy there. But I wanted to try my hand at something much larger. Uh, I had read a couple of books, um, uh, No Other World by Raul Mehta, specifically where I was like, where, where it was the sort of coming out story, but also growing up story buildings Ramon of um, this young boy who grows up over the over the course of the book and um, it follows him as he develops and I really got interested in what that looks like um, on a craft level on not like you know on a, on a on a chapter level on a part level how do you actually do that over the course of a book um, and I thought it was a wonderful challenge so that was my that was my initial thought going in um, 
And then as I started to block up the story, it started to seem like it was gonna span more globally. Um, Cause I started in Tamil Nadu, but I knew that it, it can't end there because it needed a more global scope. Kalki needed to have, like to reckon with the world in some way. And, uh, and New York seemed like a really great place to make that happen. Yeah. Did you know uh, from early on that it would, it would span a decade? We begin with Kalki being, being a child and performing possibly a series of miracles. And then we, we end with him as an adult. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, I, I did know early on. So the first draft um, already had New York and it already had that sort of 10 year, 12 year span. Um, mostly because I was interested in the, in the idea of child gods and I was researching a lot about these, um, these children who are believed to be holy or believed to be um, you know, miracle makers, um, healers, et cetera. And no one was talking about them as adults. Um, they were, you know, they were sort of frozen in time as these child gods. Um, and yet, you know, most of them do grow up and they sort of like disappear in from the news cycle. And so I wanted to, I definitely wanted to look at what that does to a person to, you know, believe yourself divine. And then, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that as an adolescent? And then how do you deal with that as a young adult? Hmm. It sounds a little like child prodigies in a way in which, you know, you're, you excel at something to such a great degree. And then so many of the child prodigies end up pretty screwed up as it, you know, they have a lot of, of difficult uh, issues and baggage as adults. What did you find in your research about um, these people who, well, two-parter, what did you find in your research about people who were uh, assumed to have, you know, some sort of divine power as children? And did you find this to be a sort of cross-cultural phenomenon? Like, would you find it in, you know, various faith backgrounds? I definitely found it in a lot of places I didn't expect. So I began, so the impetus for the story started with this um, new story I read about a young girl in India who was born a conjoined twin, but the twin had died in the womb. And so uh, the twin's body was basically leeching off of her and she had multiple limbs. Um, and the parents were going to, you know, get surgery to remove the conjoined twin. Um, but a lot of people didn't want them to because this girl had multiple limbs and um, people were like, she's, she's the vessel for the goddess and you can't, you can't take that away. Uh, and that, I was fascinated by that story. Um, and so the, I started thinking about child gods and, and um, you know, this, this urge that humans have to want to find um, the you know magic in the in our real lives and then I started researching and I found um, the Kumaris of Nepal and I read um, a, a, uh, a memoir by a former Kumari talking about her time uh, as you know as a, as a living vessel for the goddess in Nepal and I thought that was really really interesting um, I also saw this documentary called Kumare where the, <laughs> this uh, filmmaker um, who is atheist decides that he's going to pretend to be a guru and try to convince people and people like end up following him and he amasses this this great following and then he finally in the, at the end of the um, uh, documentary he ends up coming out to them as as a fraud but what was really fascinating was that a lot of them still wanted to believe him they were still like I don't mm -hmm. know what you say we still believe you and I thought that was so interesting um, what, you know, what does it say about us as humans? What does it say about the human condition that, that, that even when someone tells you they're a fraud, you want to believe it? And so I, I started thinking about all of this stuff and I started researching a little bit more and I ended up you know, really digging into Hindu mythology because that, that's my background. You know, I was raised Hindu and I wanted to sort of include that. But at the same time, I was watching the rise of Hindu nationalism in India and I was like, oh no, you know, this thing that 
I was raised with, this religion I was raised with, is now being weaponized in a different part of the world. Um, and I also wanted to reckon with that and as a writer, because I don't think, I don't think it's fair not to. I think I, I need to reckon with that. And I think especially people who are raised Hindu and, and living in you know relative privilege, especially in the West, need to reckon with what's happening in South Asia right now um, with Hindu nationalism. So like all of this stuff was sort of coming uh, coming at me as I was writing the book um, and sort of all of it sort of folded in um, into, into the story. But yeah, the, the scope of it has, hasn't really changed because that's something that I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I know I wanted to show him growing up anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to show like what happens when you lose faith. And there was the, the uh, just, I just side note, there was the kid who, um, believe that he had gone to heaven while he was on the operating table. So there, there's like, you know, it, it really spans all cultures, all uh, religions, all different kinds of, um, you know, places and privilege and all of that. So uh, that's, that's why I thought it was such a universal story and something that everybody could relate to. And that kid sold a lot of books. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to, I mean, just between all of us in this room, if you want to fake like, you know, you have divine powers and maybe you do, who's to say it's fake? Uh, you know, we can maybe do a follow-up to this book. Um, Cindy, can you talk a little bit about, and, you know, I don't know how much you want to get into, uh, you know, personal stuff or not uh, totally up to you, but uh, your own sort of journey with faith, if I can talk about it that way. Like, so you said you were raised, you know, within the, the Hindu, the Hindu faith. And, you know, I, I know at this point, you do not believe in, you know, in the reality of, of that religion, but maybe talk a little bit about what happened, you know, what was your process? And how did that affect the writing of the book? And, and, you know, are there maybe losses that come with, you know, losing that sort of faith? And are there bonuses that come with it? Yeah, uh, so I mean, I'm, I identify as an atheist um, and I have done so for a long time, um, but a lot of that journey had to do with my coming out as queer. Cause you know, my parents were religious, but not, not really attached to it uh, for a long time as I was growing up. And then um, when I was 17, I came out to them and they got super religious. Like their response was, <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to pray and it's going to work. So that was their response and they got super religious. And so um, I started and my, and by extension, my whole extended family got really religious, except for all the cousins who, you know, remained sort of skeptical, agnostic, atheist. Um, and so there's this definite generational split in my family. And it's, it, again, it fascinated me from a human level, you know, what um, the ways in which people put faith, but also, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, a belief in change through these, um, I guess, like it, through these gods or, or vessels that they can't control. So like when, when life seems like it's getting out of their control, this is a way to reckon with that, to um, deal with it. Mm. And I think, you know, I've, the things I miss about that, um, probably like there is a certain sort of comfort blanket type safety in thinking that there's somebody watching over you all the time. And when you're an atheist, you don't have that. <laughs> you're sort of, you know, contending with the idea that there's no one out there looking out for you and that everything is chaos and you just happen to accidentally end up on this planet for 80 years, uh, hopefully. And, and that, you yes. know, <laughs> yeah. And that 
you know, nothing you do really actually matters in the grand scope of things. So like, it, it's a very different way to look at the world. And um, there's also been these studies that show like people who are religious tend to be, um, to tend to have more peace mentally because they, you know, they essentially have faith that everything will turn out well. And when mm. you look in the randomness of things, you don't have that faith. So that's something I think is, has been difficult to deal with. And I've seen a lot of friends lose their faith over the years. And um, I have a friend who was raised really, you know, evangelical Christian who lost her faith and then had to contend with mortality because she mm. believed that she was going to live forever. And now she was told that, I mean, she realized she wasn't. And that's a completely different way of looking at the world and moving through the world. Um, so yeah, it's, it's to me that that process is really interesting, that loss of faith. And then the, I guess the regaining of meaning in your life when you realize mm -hmm. that you're like, no one's telling you what your life is supposed to mean and you, you get to choose. Yeah. There's a comedian named Paula Tompkins who talks sometimes about his mother's death. And she was, you know, I don't know, seventies, maybe 80. And she became an atheist like one year before she died. And it's, I mean, it's such an odd trajectory, right? <laughs> like be punching the card at the Catholic church your entire life. And then at the end, be like, you know what? I don't think so. Um, but I mean, it's really fascinating the way these things manifest. Um, like I've found, you know, I'm like you, I, I am, you know, I would identify as an atheist, not like a shot it from the rooftops on Twitter type, but, uh, but it's both my parents have had health issues this summer. And during times I stay with them, I find myself getting all these church songs like from Catholic church from when I was a kid stuck in my head. And it's not that they're playing them there. It's just, there's this hardwired deep like stuff that being A with my parents and B, you know, them sort of dealing with mortality is obviously like churning up in my synapses. And so there's a, a sense in which you can, you know, you can leave a faith, but you know, you also, you also don't and can't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it lives within you forever, probably. Were you, were you able to have the kind of objectivity? So you said that, it, you know, when you had your parents and, you know, a half dozen aunts and uncles like praying the gay away for you, uh, were you able to have the kind of that maturity of perspective? You know, okay, I understand these people are having sort of a crisis. It involves me. Or was it more, I mean, I w if I was a teenager, I would have been so like, I hate this. But it sounds like maybe you had a little more perspective. I mean, I have perspective now. I think like during the time I was really upset about it. And like when I was a young adult, they were trying to sort of get me to get married, um, straight married. And, you know, they, they continually set me up with these, um, other Sri Lankan men, like every time I went home, you know, it was, I would get ambushed by all of this. And it, it was very, very stressful. And I was very resentful for a long time. Um, and it's, yeah. it's only very recently that I've sort of been like, okay, I, I understand what you were trying to do. And it was coming from a place of love, even though it was also coming from a place of control. Yeah, definitely. I, I want to go back to, um, uh, that comment you made about, um, I, I'm interested in the, um, the story of the, the child who was born um, as the surviving half of a, a pair of conjoined twins. Um, and there's a, so your, your last book dealt explicitly with, with queerness and, you know, a, you know, a, gay guy and a, a gay woman who, you know, are gonna fake a marriage just and then hook up with people on the side. Like it's very text, it's right there. This book does deal in a, you know, a sort of text level with, with queerness and, and how, you know, what we think of as queerness manifests in, in other cultures, you know, queerness, transness. 
uh, gayness. And, um, but it seems to me at, at, at a, a deeper level, the book is just saturated with a, a kind of queerness. There's a sort of queer energy to it. And the, you know, the condition of, you know, you think of, for instance, this, this child who um, could have had this, you know, corrective surgery and how much um, we push people towards these, these societal norms, you know, and I mean, you certainly, the change in the way that, that as a culture, um, we deal with, for instance, intersex children has been, you know, a similar sort of shift, but it seems like there's something about the Kalki's condition that is fundamentally queer, just the fact of his being, having this sort of existence that is, is so outside of uh, what would be perceived as normal, like having blue skin. And I, I wonder if, um, if you can talk a little bit about how that played into, you know, sort of the way you're able to deal with queer issues within the book. And maybe you can tell us a little bit as well about um, the, the cultures, what, you know, what we would call trans people in the US um, and, and how your research on that ended up fitting into this, you know, this book that is queer in very sort of multivalent ways, I would say. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, part of it is that pre-modern, pre-colonial cultures have always had, well, not all of them, but many have had a tolerance and an acceptance of difference and what we might call queerness uh, in a way that fundamentally changed after, um, you know, Britain colonized the world and brought Victorian English values to every every corner of the continent. That's part of why, you know, Kelki has to sort of be sheltered and isolated at this ashram in rural Tamil Nadu because that's, you know, it, it's a corner of the world that is colonized, but has resisted uh, the kind of um, conversion to Christianity and colonization that uh, has existed elsewhere in the world um, and that has succeeded elsewhere. And so I wanted to find a little corner of the world where this little boy who might otherwise be forced to, you know, I don't know, uh, be shunned or be hated for his difference is actually celebrated, is actually worshipped. And, um, and, I, and I wanted to sort of, you know, gesture at this sort of pre-colonial mentality that um, the difference, that what is different can be holy, what is different can be important, what is different can be a source of power. Uh, and I think, you know, colonization changed a lot of that. Um, the spread of Christianity changed a lot of that. Uh, but these sort of, these pre-Christian, pre-colonial -col um, beliefs are, I think, still alive and well, and um, we just need to know where to look to still find them. And I think they're also having a resurgence in the global north, you know, in, in um, the westernized world. I think, I think these, you know, people are getting more and more interested in unearthing these pre-colonial uh, beliefs and pre-colonial practices uh, and rituals. Mm -hmm. You know, witchcraft is having a moment right now. Uh, um, astrology is really big. You know, all of those things that people, people seem um, to really want to reach back before uh, colonization and bring something forward uh, that gives their life some meaning um, outside of organized religion. So I was, you know, thinking about all of that as well and, and mm -hmm. trying to, um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I lost track of your question. <laughs> no, no, that, that's, uh, that, that, that is interesting. So it does seem like maybe in a vacuum of belief, people are, are searching for some sort of connection, you know, to other belief systems and, uh, you know, I'd much rather it be Wicca than QAnon, personally. Mm -hmm. um, and 
so the the question of of um, you know research for this book. Now I know you did a lot of research, and we're you know very concerned with with authenticity, representation, just making sure you got things right in terms of dealing with you know again what what we in America might call you know queerness. Um, but uh, can you talk a little bit about um, you know what you learned as you were researching? researching this book and sort of how you, how did you do the research? Uh, part of it was just doing, you know, part of it was that I, I had been doing research into queer cultures in, and queer histories in South Asia for a long time now. Um, specifically, I was researching the Hijra community, um, which, you know, mm -hmm there's like a trans experience that's common. Um, some Hijras do identify as trans and some don't. Um, and so I was specifically then interested in like, what, what does that look like within the Tamil context specifically? And mm -hmm. I, you know, it was good timing because in the last 10 years, trans rights has really come to a forefront in, um, in, the, in Southern India. And you know there are, are trans organizations. There's advocacy going on. There's a lot of legislative push. Um, not that it's been wholly successful, but um, there's there you know there is that presence. And um, you know, in Tamil, the word is Thirunar, which um, uh, is a self-named uh, community, which is really I thought mm. was really awesome. Um, so I, was, I, I hired a, with Soho's help, of course, I hired a, um, a sensitivity reader who uh, is a Tamil trans woman in India. And I wanted to make absolutely sure that, um, and I had a couple of trans readers that I'm friends with here read the book as well to make sure that I wasn't doing, you know, that I wasn't stepping outside of the bounds of you know, what I, what my lane might be. Um, and I'm, I'm genderqueer and I'm, you know, non-binary, but I'm not trans. And so like, you know, I wanted to make sure that that was good. That was um, an okay depiction, you know, a, a character who feels real, um, who isn't offensive in any way, um, but who is allowed to exist in her individuality. Cause that's important too, right? Like a character can't just be sort of cipher for an entire community, they have to be an individual person. Uh, so I was, I was trying to balance those two things. Um, and then I, this is, you know, it's, uh, when you talked about how, how queerness sort of exists on a textual level in Marriage of a Thousand Lies, um, when I started writing this book, I was like, okay, now I want to write a book where, where people are queer, but the book is not about queerness. Like it doesn't, it doesn't tackle coming out, but at every right. turn there is queerness sort of embedded into the book. So that's that's sort of what I was interested in because I'd already written a book that was like primarily uh, the fulcrum that the book was centering on was was itself queerness and the identity itself. And now I wanted to just you know write other things, write about faith, write about religion, but to have a character who is queer. Um, both in a sec, you know, both in terms of sexuality, but also probably in terms of gender. To me, Kaki is a very non-binary kind of character because he doesn't fully identify as a man, whatever that means. He's sort of trying to figure out, um, you know, if he's a god or not, and that's that's a different <laughs> question, right? That just sort of pushes gender out of um, out of the way because this is such a bigger question for him. So. Uh, so yeah, like I, I wanted to write a queer book without talking about queerness all the time. <laughs> and, and I hope I succeeded. I mean, I was also interested in tackling questions of caste within the Indian world um, and within Hinduism. And so another sensitivity reader um, was, uh, I sought out another sensitivity reader because I have a character who is Dalit. And, um, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, I'm not Dalit and as a, uh, like a, a caste privileged person, I didn't want to, um, you know, do anything offensive or, you know, cause it's unintentional. That's the thing. Like when you're steeped in yeah. privilege, 
you unintentionally make mistakes when you're writing characters. And I think that's part of our job as writers is to recognize when we have privilege and to research as much as we can and put in the work to make sure that our representations are accurate and uh, forward thinking and useful and good overall for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's, it's interesting. I think there's a lot of discourse around the notion of sensitivity readers that is, uh, that is often unfair because, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, what, before there were sensitivity readers, uh, you know, as a term that we use, you would absolutely want to have people, you know, who are embedded in these cultures, like be able to look at your book, like, that's a, it's important. And it's a, you know, it's a real privilege to be able to have that, you know, I mean, you wouldn't write a book about, um, you know, a Microsoft engineer as a non-Microsoft engineer without being like, hey, uh, what am I getting wrong here? Is this gonna be reasonably okay? Or am I like completely screwing up, uh, you know, what, I don't know, what coding is like and how that manifests. And, and so I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing how it's become a sort of uh, rhetorical, football that gets tossed around and people don't acknowledge it as just sort of a part of an important part of the writing process that you know has always been important but when it comes to certain types of things the computer engineer yes people would always you know make sure they got that right they wouldn't necessarily make sure they get right a trans character um and i'm wondering if if you can think of an example of, of something that came up during the process of, of working with these outside readers where the the book the book changed in some way and you were you know you felt glad to have had the read yeah i um specifically working with my um sensitivity reader for cast um she's a writer herself her name is mimi mandal um, and she, you know, she sort of engaged with me as a writer. So I had, um, I had originally written a character who embodied a couple of um, harmful tropes uh, of mm -hmm. women that, you know, Mimi pointed out. And then um, she worked with me, you know, she gave me suggestions and we're, we sort of troubleshot it like writers and she you know we were like okay I was like all right what if this character you know did this and what what if you know she changed in this way um and it was just really really cool to and and I think that character and the relationship she has with the people around her completely changed as a result right. um right. with the with the trans character um it was mostly about like updating terminology because it's you know, the terminology is changing in the Tamil context so fast mm -hmm. that I wanted to make sure that I had the most updated um, terminology for, uh, for Tamil Nadu in India um, for that specific community. So it was, it was really useful. And, you know, I also had an accuracy reader um, and I hate that there's two different words. I guess they're all accuracy readers. Um, right. I had an accuracy reader for like the details of Kalki's life in Tamil Nadu because he is um, part of a Brahmin family, part of a Hindu Brahmin, specifically Iyengar family. And I want to make sure like every ritual and everything they wore and every little detail of their like house and, and their lives made sense within that context. And so I, I worked with somebody for that too. And I'm, I'm super, super grateful because I, try my hardest to get things right. I like the research. I like getting, um, being accurate about the experience. I want, because I'm writing not only for a general audience, but also for people who are in those specific communities. And I want them to read it and feel seen and not, you know, read it and feel like they've, they've been betrayed. 
because I've I've felt that as a as a you know a mm. brown queer <laughs> gender queer person I have definitely read depictions where I'm like this does not feel authentic at all to me and it doesn't feel like you know authenticity is this weird sort of scare word that is as is needs to be parsed out but for me it doesn't reflect me at all and it's supposed to and I, I right. felt that cognitive dissonance and I don't want anyone else to feel that um, from my work. So I, I try to do my best to, um, to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. Stephen, um, I wonder if this would be a good time to allow people to, to unmute, to feel free to turn on your video and, and open things up for questions. Yep, I just uh, um, allow everyone to unmute um, themselves if they feel the if they feel they want to ask a question or turn on your video if you'd like. Um, and while everyone's getting the hang of how to do that, um, Cindy, I actually had a question for you. Um, why did you choose specifically New York and the underground music scene as a way to transition into Kalki's adult life? I wanted a place where everything that Kalki has been taught will be upended. And, you know, I wanted a really, really cosmopolitan, very diverse place that's also sort of hard to be in. Like there are some cities where it feels really easy to be there. It feels like when you're in Boston, you never feel like you're in a really big city. And there are like these, you know, it's, it's like organized into these little like sub um, little communities and squares where it feels comfortable. And I wanted Kalki to be as uncomfortable as possible. And so I wanted a big city and the one I was most familiar with was New York. And so I was like, all right, we're gonna put him in New York. And, and I wanted, um, you know, I, I've gone to a lot of shows. I've been sort of adjacent to a lot of bands. Um, and I thought the, like that life, especially because it exists at night it, um, it, you know, it, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of like debauchery. And I, that's exactly the opposite of everything kelki has been taught. And I wanted to place him in an environment that was wholly alien, but also challenging him at every turn. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of my thinking <laughs> about New York. And it's a fluid world there too, in terms of sexuality, gender presentation, like the people are, I, it's, it's kind of a mind-blowing thing for Kalki, right? Because amongst his, his friend group, there are people who, you know, they'll just kind of sleep with anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very different uh, presentation of sexuality. Do we have um, questions I'd love to have someone not me speaking. And honestly, um, you can ask anything. I'm, you know, very open. I have a question that um, I'm always very fascinated by the appearance of non-human animals in books. And, uh, you know, I think it's really fun and illuminating to see how people relate to them. Like in my own writing, I. I got a dog like three years ago and I, I find in my, my new book I'm working on, there's dogs keep appearing in various ways. And then you can really use people's relationships with dogs in, in interesting ways. There's a great horse in your book. And I'd like to hear, when did this, when did this horse appear in the novel? And then how did you decide this horse is gonna be, gonna be with us for, a big chunk of the book. I wanted, you know, I wanted Kalki to have something stable in his life, a relationship that was fairly stable. And with everybody else, those relate, every, you know, all the other humans that those relationships shift and change um, as he grows. And especially as he has, as a child, he's, he's sort of putting, his faith in someone and then they're, you know, being betrayed or the things that we all have happened to us as children. Um, but I also wanted something that's more stable in his life, some, some refuge 
where he can go that's when he can be with his thoughts, but also be in the company of a comforting presence. And I felt mm -hmm. like, you know, sometimes we're too mean to our characters. Um, part of fiction writing is just being mean to your characters, but it's also about being kind to them and, and letting them have those moments that they need to, to really process what's going on with them. And so the, that's how the horse sort of began. Um, because for Kalki, for his, you know, who he is and who he's supposed to be as this god, the horse is the, makes the most sense within the prophecy uh, that he's trying to fulfill. So there's the horse. And um, for me, I, I love, like, I've had cats for a long time. Um, and I, I, I don't know if the horse is more cat-like or more horse-like. <laughs> uh, I feel like it might be more and end up being more cat-like because that's, you know, that's the kind of relationship I have with animals. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted, um, I wanted Kelki to, to have that kind of um, deep connection with somebody who would not betray him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good horse. And if it's, you know, a cat-like horse, that's, it just makes it a part of the overall sort of queer ethos of the book. Uh, I see that Linda Bond has turned on her camera. Linda, do you have a question? Sorry, I'm sitting in the dark to keep it cool. Uh, we don't have lights on here. So um, yeah, I did. Um, you may or may not figure out what I'm asking, but and want to answer, but do you, are you able to, or do you differentiate between spirituality and religion? And that's the question. Um, I, I absolutely do. Um, I like in the book, there's, there's a stark difference between religion, like organized religion and what we might call spirituality. Um, and of course, you know, there is a lot of there's a Venn diagram and there's a lot of crossover. Um, but I was particularly interested in the book as a writer to explore the ways in which, um, you know, people sort of pluck from religion to uh, create their spiritualities. So like um, a lot of like new age spirituality is influenced by Hinduism without having the strictures and the organization around what it means to be a Hindu, right? Um, so that, that is interesting to me. And it's interesting that like parts, bits and pieces of Hindu philosophy and belief has been sort of imported into Western spirituality. Um, and I think that's the connection that I was really interested in. Um, but, but at the same time, spirituality is different and every, you know, it's, it, everybody has their own relationship to it. And for Kalki, the journey is about like, okay, this is organized religion. This is spirituality. Now, where do I fall in? And that's the central question that he is wrestling with. I was think sorry about the noise. I was thinking about, you mentioned uh, the pre-colonialism uh, ways that people were. And I would suspect that at that time and in many indigenous areas, um, there were people that were more drawn to, would more define themselves by spirituality versus organized religion. But I'm, you know, and there were organized groups and organized belief systems and all that, but um, there's, a, there's a way of maybe looking at spirituality as interpersonal relationships with, between people, of uh, empathizing with people, um, is that kind of spirituality, I guess, is what I was thinking about, or that, there, that within people there is an inner life that can impact on them and how they relate to each other, direct themselves outward. So that's more of what I was thinking, not so much. I mean, I know what you mean about the New Age movement and all that, and that's fine, that's, but there's a, a more basic possibly uh, understanding of spirituality that way you know I like that a lot and I think you know in in terms of the book there's I mean that's like 
that's really once you define it that way I think that's really the what is pitted against each other you know like genuine relationships between people genuine caring and kindness and interpersonal relationships that that support us and edify us chosen family that kind of thing versus this sort of strict um organized religion where like things are expected of you whether you want them or not and you're expected to do certain things just because that's how things are done um versus you know uh investing all of that energy in your relationships with people and and family and and um community so yeah that's that's absolutely um what i'm trying to do in the book yeah i I have to tell you that i've not read your book yet but um, I'm looking forward to reading and reviewing it, but that is what drew me to it because as soon as I saw your topic and the main character, uh, something, it felt like, ah, this this probably got some spirituality in it. I mean, in that that sense of people to people kind of thing. And that's that's why I was drawn to it. So, or whatever. Well, thank you for reading it. Um, yes, and thank you everyone for being here. There's a lot more questions I would like to keep asking you, Sindhu, and I think the we didn't even get to get into this great character of the book, this a very problematic father who is angry and controlling and self-pitying and just this, and and loving and caring, but, you know, expresses it in some really uh, some ways that that are not best fatherhood practices. Um, and yeah, there's so much richness to this book and I, I certainly encourage everyone who's here to, um, you know, to, uh, to read it because it's amazing. Um, and so thank you. I'm just gonna make sure that there's no, uh, yes. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and, and, and Cindy, thank you for, for taking the time on your post-pandemic or post-vaccinated road trip to <laughs> to visit with us and talk about this wonderful book. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Both of you. Thank you. And thanks, Mark. Thank you. For all the questions. All right. You're welcome. And I'll have more questions for you when we see each other in person. Thanks everyone. All right, Stephen, are we looking good? Yep. Yeah, we are. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, This has been fantastic. And thank you, especially to the booksellers who took out uh, time out of their busy schedules um, to come and join us for, for, you know, 50 minutes to an hour. So thank you guys so much. And we'll talk soon. And and if you need anything.